I am excited to be able to do this actually because unlike uh, the four women on the panel, I'm not a Villanova uh, alum. You'll see no apostrophes and uh, <laughs> graduation years behind my name. Uh, so it means a lot. I've been a Villanova now for six and a half years, so it means a lot to be able to engage in programs uh, like this. So we, we've had a, a couple calls and some emails going back and forth about our topic today. So we have some questions that we prepared that we're going to start off with and, and lead through the program. But we want this to be engaging, and we want all of you, I'm sure you have questions. Uh, for those of you who are here this morning for our 10.30 a.m. session with Michelle Ansel, there were a lot of great questions. So I'm certain that many of you have questions as well. So we want to make sure that we get to those. Uh, once we, we do sort of the first run through, if you do have a question, uh, raise your hand. And when you do ask your question, uh, just make sure to introduce yourself, uh, name, and maybe your Villanova affiliation, just so we can get an idea of who's in the room at that part. So my role really uh, opened up the session to talk just a little bit about disruptive uh, <clears throat> innovation and what that is, you know, just to lay a foundation. So uh, on the academic side of disruptive innovation, so Clayton Christensen coined this term back in 1995, talking about innovations and things that happen within businesses and sectors that really are transformative in terms of creating a new market or a new industry, fundamentally changing the way uh, that businesses operate uh, in the U.S. and worldwide. And there's really a variety of those that, that I'm sure you all can think of and engage with. I wanted to provide one specific example that I think is pretty easy to follow, and that's around uh, the music industry. So originally uh, with music, one of the, the first uh, disruptive innovations in the music industry was around uh, digital synthesizers. So that allowed, instead of being able to carry and move pianos, you know, from concert venue to concert venue and, you know, uh, bowling alley to bowling alley to do your concert, right? You could easily portably move music around. So guitar amps, things like that. So the digital synthesizer fundamentally changed the way people were able to engage with the music industry. That, of course, then led into the gramophone, which was another innovation, another, another disruptive point, because then it became easier to have uh, media and music in your home to be able to play and listen to, to music. That led into the digital media phase, so CDs that were now available, even when cassette tapes existed sort of in between that phase, that wasn't as disruptive, that w wouldn't be classified as a disruptive innovation, because the difference between having records and having cassette tapes didn't fundamentally change, didn't create a new market within the industry. But CDs did, because with CDs you could burn CDs, copy your own music, really get it distributed much, much easier uh, around. So. The digital media then fundamentally was a disruptive innovation in the music industry. And finally, last, which we're all familiar with now, is streaming. So the ability to stream music, be able to listen to music, not even have a CD, not even buy a CD. I know personally, uh, you, you, you used to be a big deal to see the cover art and what the inside of your, your CD looked like and what was happening on the records, all those things. That, that today is not an important part of the music experience because it's so easy to buy, download music, share music across a variety of mediums, even not even buying music, just listening to it uh, for free on Pandora and other places like that. So you can see how streaming technology was really a disruptive innovation in that process. The, the film industry also followed a very specific, very similar track to that, the way things that were developed. And I can speak for myself being a, uh, someone who paid my way through college uh, working for, for Viacom as a film distribution engineer during college. That's code for a blockbuster video customer service <laughs> work. <laughs> this was a wonderful job and I loved it. But that industry is completely closed. There, there, are, there are very few blockbuster videos left in the United States. In fact, you may be surprised to know that there are blockbuster videos left in the United States. They're in Alaska in areas where it's very hard to get streaming data, where they still pay for their internet by the megabyte, by how much they download. So streaming there wouldn't make sense, right? So that has a disrupted all the way in Alaska. But blockbusters are virtually closed. So you can see in that example how disruptive innovations take place. That's the foundation that we're going to talk about today through uh, these women's experience, their different companies, their different ventures, and what they, what they are involved with. So we're going to have each of the panelists introduce themselves and talk about the company you work for, uh, quick about your Villanova background, and then your role with that company in the innovation process. So we'll start with Mary. Uh, so I'm Mary Naylor, uh, and I'm really excited. I think today is a disruptive experience to have all of us um, uh, to here and with the launch of the McNulty Institute. I am on the board of trustees, so to see 
this happening here at Villanova is extraordinarily, extraordinarily exciting for all of you um, and for all of the women and guys to come uh, uh, to here. So I'm at the University of Pennsylvania. I head a research center. Uh, and the disruption that I'll tell you a little bit about is the work that we've been doing and trying to change the way healthcare is delivered in the United States. Just a little task, uh, but it's been quite a journey. I'm sorry to hear block Blockbuster closed. I really didn't realize that. But <laughs> we can go to Alaska. If we can. <laughs> exactly. Fran? I have a gift card to Blockbuster, so <laughs> I'm going to send it to my cousin Alaska and say, go use it. But, um, I'm Fran Burns. I'm an undergraduate here at Villanova in 1997, majored in political science, minored in history, and then um, continued right through to get my Master's of Public Administration at Villanova. Currently just joined the Villanova faculty in the Master of Public Administration. Um, but I'm here today to talk, um, thank you, uh, to talk uh, mostly about my experience in Philadelphia government. Uh, most recently I served four years as Chief Operating Officer for the School District of Philadelphia. Um, prior to that, I had different experience in budget, managing director's office, and I'd run the, I ran the building de department, the Department of Licenses and Inspections for the City of Philadelphia, the agency everyone loves to hate. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> probably the hardest job I will have in my life, at least I hope so. Um, so in, in terms of kind of what I brought my leadership at, in terms of disruptive, it kind of was a meat and potatoes approach, which was just the people are going to work. Um, we have 130,000 uh, children, uh, of which 30% by grade 8 can read um, proficiently. So we're going to work. I mean, things aren't going to be what you're used to um, in terms of coming into work every day. And um, we have a responsibility to the service of children. We have a responsibility to taxpayers. And um, we have a responsibility to be ethical and professional and hold ourselves accountable and to high expectations. So that's... What I'd like to think is the disruptive um, presence that I would bring uh, to the public sector work. Um, I'm Sue Scanlon. I graduated um, from Villanova um, as uh, with BSN in 1987 um, and actually worked for about six months as a nurse and um, was kind of uninspired by um, sort of routine following of tasks. And I really started asking questions which um, were sort of not appreciated. I was kind of told, you know, the doctor writes the order, you follow through. So I thought, you know, as much as I like doing what I'm doing, there has to be something a little more inspiring. I, you know, I need to be able to... Um, you know, to build uh, my skill set, um, but not leave the profession. So I went back and got a master's degree in nursing. Um, and at the time, things were changing, and um, I was advised to become a nurse practitioner. So I went back and did that. And then the rules changed again, and I did a post-master's to be that nurse practitioner. Um, but as I started to practice more and more, um, I really started, you know, liking the clinical side of things, um, but then began understanding that in order to deliver the clinical care I wanted to deliver, I had to understand the systems and the operations, and not just the, you know, how do you get from point A to point B, but how does my patient get from point A to point B across the continuum of care? How do we, you know, pay for this? Um, and at the time, I was working um, for the fetal surgery program at CHOP in Philadelphia, which from a, um, you know, was a very cool, innovative, of um, program, but the questions that were being posed were, you know, what are the outcome metrics that are going to make this economically viable? Should we pay for it? So I started thinking about the bigger picture of what does the downstream return on investment look like? But at the same time, my core love is really that patient care piece, but how do I bring the economic piece in? So I went back to business school um, and now um, found myself at the School of Nursing in Rutgers, um, where I um, am overseeing a federally qualified health center, um, which has been a very big challenge um, from uh, clinical care to uh, business model to the environment we're working with to working with government to working in a, I will say, very medical male-dominated market. Um, so there, there's been a lot of um, opportunity to uh, be disruptive, um, and that's how we kind of are plowing through every day. So we'll talk more, I guess. Great, and I'm Nancy Lane, class of 87. I'm the president of Local Media Association. We're a trade association that serves newspapers, TV stations, radio stations, but we're very, very focused on helping local media companies discover new and sustainable business models. And I, I said it earlier today, you know, why? Because we don't want watchdog journalism in our country to go away. So we have a, a mission behind what we are trying to do at Local Media Association. 
But if you think about the disruption that has hit the media industry, I mean, it's among the most disrupted industries. How many of you subscribe to a printed newspaper still? Did. Yeah, very few. <laughs> um, and you and and usually it's fifty and older. When you ask a question, <laughs> right? So, how many of you are cord cutters? So you no longer subscribe to cable. Yeah. So, and how many are cord nevers? You never subscribe to cable. <laughs> yeah. See, so as the younger you go, the cord nevers come in. So TV is about to get disrupted in a big, major way. So um, what we're trying to do is help the industry find these new business models, and it's really hard. And it's hard for a lot of reasons. The number one reason is the culture that exists within legacy organizations. They're resistant to change, and they can't really see innovative opportunities in front of them. And I'll just give a few examples, like Monster, Craigslist. You know, our industry didn't develop those solutions. And those solutions killed our industry because we were an advertising-based industry reliant on classified advertising. You know, we didn't have the vision as an industry because we could only see what our legacy institutions could see, not that, op that Clay Christensen opportunity outside that, that round circle. So looking forward to discussing more about the wonderful media industry. Great. And as you, you could hear, I mean, the diversity of the panel and the industries and sectors they represent, you know, we can get a lot of feedback from a lot of different areas, which will be exciting. Uh, Fran, let's, let's hear a little bit more from you about the work you did uh, with the Philadelphia School District. Um, what, were, what were some of the impacts that happened with, when technology disrupted? Certainly in education, it's been a huge disruptor. Maybe some you know, specific examples out of that and some sure. of the ways you responded to that. So I'm going to kind of say it was a disruptor and it wasn't. And be back to the slow pace of change um, and the resistance of. Um, so the first thing that, um, in thinking of the question, is uh, the school of the future, high school of the future. So um, and not only that, but the Microsoft high school of the future. So you envision um, a brand new building built in 2006, uh, laptops only, no textbooks, beautiful uh, open space, glass everywhere, high technology, and um, two numbers for you, $65 million, which was what it cost in 2006 to build the, the building. And 2%. 2% is the 2015-2016 uh, results of the number of students that tested proficiently and advanced. 2% on um, the Keystone exams for algebra and, bio and biology. They did a little bit better in um, reading, but not by much. And so I say that to say that technology is definitely a piece of um, but without the leadership and the ability and the understanding of how to use technology, how to incorporate technology in teaching, the ability of teachers to embrace the change of what this means to their teaching now, how they use it, um, is certainly uh, still a struggle. And this was a school that was going to be the replicated model for the country. <clears throat> um, then we have, there is an emergence right now in, in blended learning, which is uh, the use of uh, technology, particularly in the classroom with, and with students and teachers. And um, this, uh, I'm not an academic, <laughs> but uh, the, my, I, you know, I believe the research to be still mixed um, on blended learning, certain um, strong advocates for it, and others who um, would say, uh, you know, incorporate it sort of when you're ready. And then I would say that the last kind of, um, and you can cut me off if I'm, in terms of technology is, and, and we see this, I mean, in the local news here at, around Villanova, but um, just the use of students in, with technology. So what they post on Facebook, um, the potential use through bullying, the, um, the use in, in, for police you know, and public safety um, to, to know, okay, after school lets out, we actually know where we're going to go because there might be a fight. So we can de-escalate, we can get it to the teachers beforehand, and we can have a different type of, type of presence when schools let out. Um, definitely in terms of sort of like the customer service and the responsiveness side, so uh, parents that tweet, my bus was an hour late, you know, or, you know, send a tweet, send something to the mayor, and the next thing you know, we're responding on an issue-by-issue -issue basis because of the use of technology. Uh, Nancy, you talked a little bit already about your role with newspapers, uh, TV stations, radio stations, how the media industry, I mean, may, may have been disrupted more, at least in recent times. 
more than any other industry out there. Um, some of the challenges you've expressed, but can you talk about maybe some of the opportunities, some of the things that are, are coming down the line that you're seeing and, and how you're addressing those? Sure. There, um, there are two kinds of companies. The companies that are in denial, which is really hard to believe you'd have companies in denial when revenues are down 60% from 2008 and the staff, staffing is down 60%. It's a, a newspaper that had 100 reporters now has 40. Uh, they can't cover the news in the same way, yet some of those leaders are still in denial, and that's why they're not transforming. And they're the newspapers that are probably going to go out of business, and it's sad. And they may be some really big newspapers. Mm -hmm. You know, the Boston Globe loses money. Um, they were bought by a billionaire, so good for them. That's a great model, but there aren't enough billionaires to buy all the newspapers and save them. So the companies that are transforming are investing in new areas, and they are um, getting into businesses that will support the core mission of community journalism, watchdog journalism. So you're seeing companies double down in events, which media companies have always dabbled in events, but now you're seeing whole events divisions being created. There's a lot of money to be made in community events and big community events, so that's an easy one. On the digital side, you're seeing a lot of digital agencies created out of media companies where they're um, working with SMBs in their markets to um, be that digital expert, to help them with their website, with their search campaigns, with their Facebook advertising. This is very hard because this is not our core competency in the media industry. And digital is hard. It's hard to train sales reps that are used to selling a print ad or a TV spot to now understand all the complexities with digital. Some companies are doing better than others, but the companies that we look to and we report on in our case studies are the companies that are diversifying in all kinds of new and different areas. And that's where it's outside the core business. Um, but they have to plan for a day when the print product is going to go away. Um, but you would not believe the number of companies that do not believe the print product's going away. Uh, there was a conference uh, last year where there were buttons, get your print swagger back. And there were <laughs> CEOs of Lindsay, my colleague, is laughing. It's a, we partner with two other associations who don't see eye to eye with us. Get your print swagger back. As they're laying off people at their companies, they're in total denial. It's just a source of frustration. And <laughs> anyway, it's still lots of opportunity, just hard, hard. So we've heard about the media industry, we've heard about education, certainly uh, healthcare and the, uh, the medical industry. Is a, is a place that has uh, significant disruptions as well. And Susan and Mary, you both are involved and engaged in that space, but from different parts of the ecosystem. Uh, maybe, Susan, you can tell a little bit about your role as uh, Chief Transformation Officer. Which, what a title. Like, what, what a great title. <laughs> <laughs> Very from an organization to have a Chief Transformation Officer. Uh, but your role there, some of the challenges that you face, and, and how you move and overcome those challenges. So, so currently, I... Um, I'm the Associate Dean of Clinical Affairs at the School of Nursing at Rutgers. I, I started, I came to Rutgers in the role, though, of Chief, the Chief Transformation Officer for one of the medical schools. Um, and from the get-go, that was, that was disruptive. Um, I was originally asked to be the Chief Nursing Officer, but to bring a model of integrated clinical practice to the medical school in the ambulatory environment and then move it into the hospital. Um, but from the perspective of um, working, um, reporting up through the dean, who was you know, a, a physician uh, group, and um, in an environment where there were probably two nurses that were hired. So I said, you know, that's not, there there's really isn't a department of nursing, um, and if what we want to accomplish is this integrated collaborative practice model, we really need to engage all stakeholders at the table. So I said, you know, I'll come, but with a different title. So my title was then changed to Chief Transformation Officer. Um, and, you know, the hardest thing, um, and, and it's really been an evolution at, at Rutgers, um, but the hardest thing, I think, was um, getting people, you know, to see that healthcare is really changing, um, and that the the model of um, you know episodic care delivery that really starts with um, a, you know an episode where someone's coming seeking healthcare because usually because they either need a physical or they're sick, um, but. That, that it's so much more than that. So to really manage someone's health 
um, you know, really requires a team, a team approach. It doesn't always require seeing a provider. Um, it's really getting that patient the resources and the right person um, to help them manage whatever the issue is and manage it long term sustainably across the continuum in a, in a way that they can afford. Um, and so that, you know, what I just said sounds very easy, but most of our healthcare institutions across this country are still very much in that fee for service economic, you know, model. Um, and so, you know, the, the challenge is still very much there. Um, I had the opportunity to make a jump to the School of Nursing, which is where I am now, um, and it's a little bit easier environment because I am in a very underserved area where the sky is kind of the limit because the need is so great. And so if we can, you know, suggest something that's going to improve some element of health or cut costs somewhere, um, I'm seeming to get support for that. Um, it's also a very underserved population, so um, I've got folks there who really want to be there. Um, I'm not being challenged on creating a team. Um, you know, nobody, you know, wants to be the person that's writing all the orders and driving everything. Um, there's a real kind of mission-based um, understanding that we need a social worker. Um, we have community health workers, who many of which don't even have college degrees, um, but can really speak the language of the culture um, and can help people, you know, access the things that they need. Um, so my, my big plan is to be able to take that model now and bring that back up through the, the larger medical school practices. And so we're beginning to have some of those conversations. Uh, but it's a long, hard road. And it's, you know, you make little incremental changes. Mm -hmm. So, Mary, your, your healthcare innovations have had a, a tremendous impact on the chronically ill older adults. Can you talk about some of those the opportunity to innovate and, and how you manage that in an industry that's often so resistant to change? Uh, so, first of all, you live long enough uh, to watch it happen because <laughs> it is a journey. It's not. Uh, um, I used to describe what's been happening in our work as sort of Irma Bombeck, but then I look at the audience, and many of you don't know Irma Bombeck. So uh, I, the, the, maybe Gail Collins in the New York Times would, uh, but it's a, it's a journey of thinking far ahead about the challenges that we're facing in our society and figuring out, wow, uh, as uh, we heard today, the beautiful uh, talk uh, that really focusing on big things matters, and you you only get one chance to do that. So years ago, we decided as a team, and I had the great fortune to lead a team of clinical scholars from nursing and medicine and the Wharton School um, communications to think about how it is that we would anticipate what's happening today. Today, 10,000 Americans are entering Medicare every day, um, and over the next 20 years, uh, one uh, uh, in uh, uh, five people will be over the age of 65. And they are living longer, and they're living longer with chronic conditions. And we haven't figured out how we're going to address that. So we decided to do that. Um, I came to Penn, uh, had this fabulous team, and we did what is traditional in a research environment. You do research. We had multiple clinical trials. We showed that a new way of handling this problem could be a, a, a curve, could get to better outcomes and reduce costs. And then we confronted reality. Nobody was using this. We had multiple clinical trials published in all the right places, and yet we had a system that was doing very well on its own. Hospitals were thriving, pharma was thriving, medical devices were thriving, but we weren't investing in care of chronically ill people. This is what Susan is talking about. So we decided to depart from the traditional uh, university path and form partnerships with health system leaders and insurers um, who have decided that we're really going to need to anticipate this future. Uh, and we've been working one health system, one community at a time to change care. We've built companies to try to make that happen. We've failed spectacularly in many of our efforts. Uh, We've had many successes recently in transforming public policy so that we now pay for transitional care services where we never did before, in helping to think about how to transform community-based care. Uh, we own and operate for a long time the PACE program at the University of Pennsylvania in the School of Nursing. So we've really set the stage by saying this is how you can do it, this is the evidence, but you need partners. You cannot do it alone. That's a, a great base to begin our, our panel discussion. Are there questions from 
the audience. I have more, but I want to make sure people have opportunity to chime in here. I'll put it out there just because I must. Um, and it is, uh, because this is a women in leadership. I'm going to throw the question at you, which I have to be all of you. Um, <laughs> what, how do you think your role would or would not have been different as a female in this industry? Are you in, in I, I don't think you're all in typically female led industries. I mean, how has the impact been for you? Um, so I must ask my, my, the question. Mm -hmm. I, you're asking okay. how 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 do you feel being a woman in leadership has impacted or helped or hindered in your line of mm -hmm. crusade? Call it that. So in many in many environments, uh, uh, I am the only nurse. Mm -hmm. um, I, I sat for many years on the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, and the only nurse. I'm on all of these boards as the only nurse, and often the only woman. And what advice would you have for the young people? Here? So I would say that you know the main uh, main thing that I've learned is that relationships matter. That everything that I've been able to be successful in has been based on establishing a relationship, uh, human relationship, trusting relationship, um, and it also has been based on the fact that it's reciprocal. Uh, so the kind of people that I engage now in work are people that when they asked me 10 years ago or 20 years ago to help them, I was always there. So it is a, a real process of building the kinds of connections, of willing to take chances. I started a long time ago. I was ended up as chair of a nursing program because I missed a meeting um, and decided <laughs> that that wasn't going to be what I need to do. Um, so I uh, really sought out leadership opportunities, uh, had a chance to study health and social policy across the globe um, to do, you know, as a result of that experience, worked on the Hill because I thought that was a great opportunity. So I, I think it's like figuring out where is it that you position yourself. And each time you're sitting next to someone with a cup of coffee, uh, you're building a relationship and you're figuring out how is it that what is important to them aligns with what's important to you so that ultimately your network continues to grow and grow and grow and you can call on those people and they can count on you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> can I add one comment? I think also being intentional is really important. I, I echo everything that you said. Um, and I think just, you know, when I look at my career and where I was and, and how hard it's been getting where I am now, but it's been very intentional and, and just really hanging in there because um, it doesn't, you know, things don't happen overnight. And um, someone said earlier today, you know, learn to accept failure, um, you know, learn to look for alternative routes. Um, I would, what frustrates me, um, we really struggle to um, get female leadership on our board. Um, we were at a point where we were down to two female board members out of 18, and it wasn't for lack of trying. Our whole board is committed to, you know, diversity and balance in every way, shape, and form, and we're now at five out of 18. I don't think that's a good scorecard, and we've um, decided to, you know, go a little bit lower in the title of the typical board member that we used to ask because we think it's that important to have a gender balance on our board. But most of our conferences are still very uh, male dominated. Lindsay and I run a lot of conferences for the media industry and, and it's not unusual to be 75% male, 25% female. And then when you um, get the chief uh, technology officers and the chief um, you know, uh, digital officers, it could be 95% male to female. So. You know, I'd love to see more women go into those fields, and I think there are so many opportunities for women. People want to hire women in those positions. Yeah, and, and you know, I appreciate the question. Mm -hmm. I, um, I probably, the wrong advice is that I actually didn't think of myself as a woman. I thought of myself as I'm confident and able to do this job, and you hired me to do the job, and I'm going to do it. Um, that said, in, in reflecting back, like actually more recently than not, um, you know, maybe I should have thought of, you know, you know, I don't know. Um, but the, they're definitely male dominated um, in construction, um, certainly in operations and certainly in facilities. 
And it didn't help me that I didn't have the functional knowledge. I mean, really, you know, the expertise, you, you, that's their first line of credibility. And at, at least in some of the roles I was in, I, wasn't, I was young, too. Um, so I was a woman and young and didn't have the functional. Um, and I just um, kind of went uh, headstrong at it. You know, just, the, again, um, this is what you, I was hired to do. I need to do the job and, you know, tell myself that, they wouldn't have hired me if I, you know. Now, then again, no one wanted to run L&I. Um, so, <laughs> kind of a by default thing. <laughs> so. Oh, I think that's a really important question. I, I, I don't know that I ever thought of myself as disruptive. Um, uh, I did. I was on a panel with Clay Christensen, who's about seven one. <laughs> I mean, he's uh, and he constantly talks. I mean, he talks at that time, at least, with a lot with his hands to tell us always watch out what's going on outside you because it's going to come and replace you unless you think about it. I would say that. Uh, I have been in many environments where, similar to Fran, I didn't have the answers. Um, I felt as if, uh, especially early on, as if I had to project that I knew a lot of stuff that I didn't. So um, I, I really spent a lot of time learning. I mean, I, I feel like I'm constantly, I'm consistently learning. Uh, now I don't mind at all saying, I don't really have a clue what you're talking about, and help me get through that. Uh, because you now have, you get to a point in your career where it's really joyful to be able to say, I don't have to be an imposter anymore. But in the beginning, I felt I needed to be more prepared than anybody. Mm -hmm. I needed to have, uh, I, I used to do reviews for NIH and would spend probably more time than the person writing the grant to come in so that I knew every aspect. I don't feel that way anymore, so you will get to a point in your career where you think, I just need to sit next to people who know I'm credible, who respect me for who I am, and who know that I don't have all the answers. I can ask them and feel comfortable doing it. So live long enough. <laughs> I just yeah. think you have to be true to yourself, too. Yeah. Just be who you are. Is there a question in the back? So what has been your approach to kind of break down barriers to the board that are resistant to change and how we're going to keep doing this? This is how we've always done it. This is how we're going to keep doing it. Where are your recommendations for working with those people and trying to open up their minds? I would say find kindred spirits. Um, it will, in your organization or in your field that uh, really, you know, can help support you um, as you're attempting to navigate sometimes these institutions that are very resistant to change. Uh, we, when we go to work with, uh, our, our first effort was to try to work with Kaiser to implement this new care model. And they had reached out to us. Uh, and, and it really mattered that we had champions in that organization because we didn't actually know what we were doing. We were building a new way of thinking about how to move research and evidence into real living world organizations. And so to have people there who think like you, who care about the same, who have kind of a shared vision, um, and who are champions when things do, and they do not work. I mean, you're, you're navigating change in an environment that uh, really is a lot of forces are pushing against it. It really matters to have that kind of support and champion leadership um, in, a, in institutions. So I don't know if that's possible in your world, but uh, look for your kindred spirits. My name is Celine Kramer. I'm from Pittsburgh. I went to the law school and graduated in 2000. I'm a business lawyer. I love that you use the term like a business kindred spirit. I, 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 I really appreciate that. My question for the panel is, have you encountered a sabotage? Somebody that is trying to sabotage your own or, you know, in the workplace. So I've been focused in researching. Just like, one? Like sabotage. Like, 
And I'd love to hear how you handled it. Success is the best revenge. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it really is. You, you gotta. Um, how I've approached it is is not fighting back. Or um, I think data speaks a lot. So really being prepared and being able to um, you know articulate in terms of data. And I think also I'm in a, a situation right now where things are. Um, not as uh, tied with a bow as I would like them to be. So um, it's very easy for people to po you know, point out failures. They're legitimate. And so I, rec I do recognize those, and that's part of the process. And so I applaud people that you know, are you know, speaking up and pointing out where um, I could be more successful um, you know, and, and looking for solution-driven. And oftentimes that kind of neutralizes the conversation. But let other people... <laughs> I don't have any of those such people. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think also as if you're running a company and you're in charge, and depending on the level of sabotage, I mean, someone could be dismissed as a result. I mean, there's that. I mean, that's kind of obvious, but it's real. Um, and uh, then there's the kind of what the answer was before. If you have a strong coalition going in it together, you try to get that to cascade throughout the organization so that you start to shift the numbers to the support of the change. That sounds, you know, but um, over time, mm -hmm. um, it can happen. So let's maybe end on a, we talked about a lot of the challenges, a lot of the obstructions. Maybe we can hear from each of the panelists maybe a transformation su success story from your industry. So uh, uh, we just had a, a recognition, I guess is about two, two weeks ago, um, there's a an award, it's called the Magnet Award. Um, so those of you that are in healthcare now, this is really for excellence in uh, care delivery. A anyway, so the, uh, this was a small hospital that we began to work with in the state of Vermont that was vitally interested in figuring out how they were gonna address the needs of the growing population of chronically ill people in rural, largely rural communities. And so they essentially have emptied out their hospital um, and have uh, refocused their entire care uh, using our approach to uh, work in the community with these chronically ill elders. And, I, and they won the Magnet Award, which was really, I mean, I think, a symbol of what is going to happen here. Um, the hospitals, some hospitals, of course we need hospitals to remain and to be a part of our care delivery system, but where we really need to make the investment is in the community with the people um, and keeping them there um, if we're ever, ever to achieve the kind of health outcomes which we need to have as a society and keep costs under control. So to me, it was um, an example of a recognition of the kind of change that we're now embarking in and that uh, uh, is, is transformational. I also want to recognize Bridget Boston of the Public Administration Program. Hi, Bridget. Um, so the, there, I'm going to just one, so in the industry in education, Orchard Gardens is a school in uh, Massachusetts that was the lowest performing in the state and is now the fourth highest performing. So uh, gotten, they received recognition from President Obama. I happened to be at a seminar where I heard the principal speak about how he transformed the school um, and the impact that it had. So orchardgardenskate.org. Um, and then I also wanted to mention the 2013 TED Talk of the Year uh, by Sugata Mitra, if I said mm -hmm. that right? Uh, and his whole premise is a cloudless school. So I wanted to get back to, because I did start with kind of how technology isn't, you know, but at the same time did wanna, uh, want to honor the impact that technology has. And he, um, just put uh, iPads in um, some depressed areas in India, and children started learning on their own with each other just by going up to the iPad and very complex um, learning. And so I wanted to end on that because I think that those two are kind of thematic with. 
Um, a recent, um, and it doesn't seem like a big accomplishment, but I am working with this really failing um, federally qualified health center in Badlands um, in, in Newark um, and have gotten um, support from the school, from the university and from the School of Nursing um, to continue to keep doors open. Um, and so there's a, a large or substantial um, dollar amount that the school is um, providing for us to continue this endeavor um, and giving us a certain time to become self-sustainable. Um, so that was, you know, a pretty big accomplishment to be able to get them to invest and, and believe that we can really turn this around. Um. You know, one of my favorite examples is um, Billy Penn here in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've taken a look, but Jim Brady, who's on our board of directors, he was one of the uh, members of the founding team of the WashingtonPost.com when, when everybody was going, you know, digital. And he's a super smart guy, and he was there for many years, and then he spent some time at another company. And then he ventured out on his own, and he started Billy Penn here in Philadelphia. And it's really a new site that's aimed at millennials. It um, you know, competes more with a BuzzFeed, which is where we need to go as an industry, and we're nowhere near there. Um, then he started um, The Incline in Pittsburgh. And if you haven't seen it, check it out. And then he bought Denverite. And the sites are now all profitable. Uh, a heavy events model, because digital alone isn't going to pay the bills, and this is coming from the digital guy at the Washington Post. And I think he's showing a model for the industry. Now, why the Philadelphia Inquirer doesn't start a billing pen, or the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, or the TV stations in those markets is beyond me, because we don't think like disruptors. Mm -hmm. But I think Jim is kind of leading the way, and it's, it's one that I'm really excited about, and I'm, I'm eager to see how he does. Great. Uh, it's a very informative panel. Very, very much appreciate all the comments. Good questions uh, from the audience. I learned learned so much, and I personally uh, want to end by saying I'm clearly very glad that I have transitioned from my my life as a film distribution engineer <laughs> <laughs> slash slash movie show uh, because I, I'm proud every day to lead this university's Innovation, Creativity, and Entrepreneurship Institute. It's a, a very important part of what we are trying to do at Villanova. Marte Giametti is our assistant director. She's in the back. Uh, Marte is a Villanova alumna uh, from chemical engineering. And together we focus every day on developing the, the creative problem solvers that are going to graduate from this university and be able to handle these disruptive innovations and, and be the people that go out and ignite change. Uh, so very much want to uh, invite all of you to continue to engage with us. We have some time between panels now. The next panel will start at 4.30 to ask some individual questions uh, of our panelists. And finally, I want to end by, by thanking all of you uh, for your, your contributions today, particularly Nancy, who <coughs> orchestrating so much of today, the entire sequence, everything, your role coming in as the, the chair of the alumni board. And just, you've been such a, an undying advocate for the ICE Institute. Um, coming and promoting our, our space and our initiatives. So thank you very much for that. And thank you to all, all the panelists. Yeah.